the um, the discussion continues, it really makes for a better talk if you guys participate with questions. All right, so with that, um, Monty is an associate curator at uh, Saatchi Art, and Saatchi Art is a group that we've been wanting to do something like this with um, because we have a handful of Cedars Union artists that have had really great success with Saatchi Art, not just selling through them, but also um, it opening up connections uh, to people locally uh, through the other art fair. Um, and uh, sorry, I have a package being delivered. Um, <laughs> uh, and um, things like that. So it's a really large organization in terms of like what they do online and um, I'm not the best equipped to answer that. So I'm gonna turn it over to start with for Monty. Could you just tell us a little bit about um, Saatchi as like what its platform is like and um, you know, what is it for people who aren't familiar with you guys? Yeah, absolutely. Can you guys hear me? Okay. And I'm going to run and grab this. I have a, my can, space is like Can you on. hear me, Adrian? I can, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. I just want to make sure that my headphones and microphone are working. Um, yeah, so Software yeah. is a, it's a really great platform. Thanks, Kristen. Um, it's an open platform for emerging artists. So artists all over the world are able to create profiles and upload portfolios of artwork. Um, and then uh, receive exposure to all of our art advisory clients, all of our collectors around the world. Um, and we actively um, promote these works um, and work on getting artists into the other art fair, um, connect them with you know, gallerists and so on and so forth. So we do a lot of work um, just really helping support emerging artists at the early stages in their career. And then throughout their career, we have a lot of artists with us who are more established um, and they've been working for a really long time but um, they found a lot of success on Saatchi Art uh, through sales and through you know showing at the other art fair and making connections as you said um, you know with local galleries and so on and so forth and um, yeah so, so that's that's what we do that's our day-to-day -day, is working with the artist showing the work and helping clients find your work when they're looking for our work for whether it's like a trade project or an individual collector's office, so on and so forth. Yeah, so it kind of exists in this, like, it's not, um, you know, walking into a gallery uh, and seeing work in person, but it's also, you're supporting living artists. Um, yeah. It's, it's not, you know, it's not the same as, um, just kind of going to Pier One and buying a printed piece, right? That might be a living right. artist, but like there's a you're you're kind of filled a in between those two models of a of a gap. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, sort of like a gallery in the sense that um, artists, you know, will we will show the work of an artist, and then an artist will see will receive a commission on a sale versus us just um, you know selling like a. a print and an artist not necessarily receiving um, any of the payment on that. Like if it was Pure One, for example, you know, we yeah. would buy the, like we don't buy the rights to anything. Um, so yeah, that would be, that would be the main difference, but it's strictly online. So um, anybody can come and uh, browse the site. They can go to an artist's profile and check out their portfolio and look at all of their work. Um, and it's really interesting because you can, you can go back and you can see artists who've been with us for a really long time and go back through their portfolio and you really get a great sense of how an artist is developing um, as time goes on and as their work, you see this really continuous flow of all of their work. It's really cool. So um, it's nice. You don't necessarily get that in a gallery or really anywhere else. Yeah. And it's an open um, platform, meaning anyone can post. Anybody, and yeah. Yeah, so anybody anywhere in the world um, can create a profile, upload work, um, and it's completely free. So we don't charge anything to have a page or have a profile. Um, we don't charge artists to be featured in any of our marketing or advertising or anything like that. Um, we do print features and um, digital campaigns throughout the year. And we basically just select um, artists based on, you know, their work, um, whether or not we think that it's relevant for whatever the campaign is, and um, having like a full portfolio with a lot of options to choose from is really great. So um, 
it, yeah, it, it's totally free. Really the only, the only um, not like we just take a commission on the sales and it's only 35%. So with a gallery, it might be 50, 50. So you make a lot more when you sell online. Um, and then we handle all of the shipping and logistics and insurance and all the back and forth with the clients. So all you guys have to do is kind of pack up your work and get it out the door. Yeah. And, and just to talk a little bit more about your role there, just so uh, yeah. our listeners might have better ideas of um, what kind of questions they might come to you with. What do you, what do, you do as associate curator? Yeah. So as an associate curator, my job is not only to um, work with artists on getting them onboarded, um, improving their portfolios and their profiles, um, reviewing all of the work that comes onto the site every single day. So as work is uploaded, we review it and we recommend it to our clients. Um, but I'm also doing a lot of, of client facing work. So working with collectors who are looking for assistance, finding artwork um, and uh, working with trade clients who have big projects we have a hospitality team as well. Um, I don't do so much on the hospitality side, but we have a hospitality team that will help, um, you know, fill an entire like uh, hotel space or, you know, a, a cruise ship and design all of the art for these like really big commercial projects. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool too. That's, that's, that's a cool part of the job as well. Yeah. But um, I'm also, particularly, a lot of my responsibilities are around um, finding artwork and selecting artists to be featured in our digital and our print campaigns. So I do a lot of the merchandising work for the website. And you're looking at art all, all day, day. Long. <laughs> now, <laughs> How? Honestly, I probably review, um, oh my God, upwards of maybe, 8,000 artworks a day and I may have seen some of them previously but I'm looking through that many artworks every day in my job just on a regular basis whether it's reviewing new work that's coming onto the site or looking for something really specific for a client mm. that's a lot <laughs> <laughs> okay so <laughs> how many new pieces would you say get uploaded to the site each day uh it really varies it's probably a couple hundred maybe around 300 is is sort of a safe bet. Um, it's interesting, sometimes there are really productive times. Like I would say during um, the, with the coronavirus outbreak and the pandemic, a lot of artists who have been able to produce have been extremely productive. Um, mm -hmm. I know not all artists have been fortunate enough to have a studio, have access to the materials um, and to be somewhere that they're you know, able to be putting in the time and the work into, into creating artwork. Um, but the artists who, do have that situation or are really just creating a lot of um, amazing work right now. So it's been interesting to see like some days we'll have a ton of work being uploaded and some days there's a little bit more of a lull, but it's probably around three, three to 400 pieces. Okay. Yeah. So with that, with that special place that you have where you're, you're dealing with art sales on like a, a much larger scale than a lot of um, art institutions might be, but also seeing the, the way that the open platform is, the way you're seeing art coming in. I feel like that positions you kind of uniquely in your viewpoint of the art market and also art production today. Um, so those are some things I kind of want to talk about. Um, but uh, yeah, let's start with... Um, Let's start with this market in particular. What, like, what do you think, oh, for instance, you have a price attached to every piece, right? You make shopping a little bit more uh, accessible, whereas I think mm -hmm. that that's a lot of the time the most intimidating thing for art yeah. buyers is like, okay, I really like this piece, but I'm going to feel like an idiot if it's like $8,000 in my budget. <laughs> yeah. You know, and... <laughs> Um, so I think even just like the transparency of, of pricing is a big part of what's successful. Um, do you have anything like that that you've learned that you would have artists reconsider in their own websites or in their own personal marketing? Yeah, no, I think that's actually a really great point. Um, so one of the great things about having all of this transparency and um, having collectors uh, they have the ability to, 
to go and explore a portfolio and you know learn more about an artist and um, you know they can see what what pricing they're looking at when they look at a piece it's all very immediate and upfront and they have access to all that information um, I would definitely always encourage an artist if you are selling your work if you have a portfolio online to include pricing I think that's it's just really you know easy it um, it takes away any of the questions that people might have and and really breaks down that intimidation barrier um, I think another really important thing is making sure that you have really good photographs of your work um, that, you know, from multiple angles so that people know exactly what they're getting, they can see the texture. Because online, you know, you don't necessarily have all of that um, in-person experience. It's not so tactile. You can't really, like, get up close and look. So the more information that you can provide to somebody um, right up front, the better. And that's mm -hmm. going to include visual information like good photos. Um, so I think, I think that's really great. And uh, another thing that we get a lot of questions about, um, when people are really taken with a piece, they want to know what inspired the artist and, you know, what motivated them, what, you know, they want to know interesting things about your practice. Um, so having a great artist statement and having, you know, on South Chair, what we do is we have a description field underneath of the artwork. So filling out that info and just giving people as much information as you can about the work. Um, it's just giving people more reasons to really connect with it. So uh, I, I like to see really full portfolios with a lot of information and um, lots of great photos and info about the work. So I think that's really helpful for, for buyers to be able to see immediately when they're checking something out. Yeah, for everything. I mean, we, yeah. we had that conversation um, last month we had a talk with a curator and a, a frequent art juror and she was, we were talking about the importance of good photos. Um, but n right now, as everything's continually more virtual um, and you're even seeing exhibitions online, like taking yeah. good photos is really something that everyone needs to figure out for themselves. Um, we do have uh, on at the Cedars Union Instagram page on our little resource highlights, there is a video that um, that Kay Seedig, uh, an artist that I used to work with, made on how to use, how to take better photos with just your iPhone and like really easy, free downloadable editing software. So we are kind of at this unprecedented time of, um, oh gosh, I use that word. I'm not talking about COVID-19. <laughs> I'm talking about camera technology um, where, you know, you might not know a lot about photography and you know f-stops and exposures but um phone cameras have gotten so good it, but mm -hmm. using natural lights your best advantage things like that. yeah definitely daylight um i think a lot of times it can be hard to get the colors right mm -hmm. uh, especially when you know you have um something that's going to be graded to web so um, what we always recommend, uh, if you do have a Satchier profile, is making sure that you're, we have like a whole resource that's all about photography and making sure that your format is correct so that the colors are optimized for the site. Um, but bright daylight is always really good, I think, for communicating what the colors are actually going to look like on an artwork. Yeah. Um, you also talked about uh, statements. Do you have... Um, just, do you guys recommend like a length for statements? Like is, what is your too long, too short kind of feeling? Um, you know, what I think is more important um, with regards to artist statements is just having, having um, all of the information that, for me personally as a curator, when I go and I try to find an artist and I have to write a bio about them, for example, um, I like to go and see an artist statement that has a lot of information about, you know, are, are you self-taught? Did you study somewhere? Um, what drives you? Give me a little bit about your history. Where are you from? Um, you know, what, what materials do you like to work in? And where's your inspiration coming from? Um, have you won any awards? Have you shown any at any, you know, galleries? Um, has your work been published anywhere? So I think including those sort of factual tidbits um, are really helpful for um, collectors to kind of get confidence about who you are as an artist and your practice, um, and also to make that personal connection. So things like, 
what inspires you, what motivates you, where are you from? These are these are things that uh, a collector might be like, oh my gosh, I'm from the same small town. I have to buy a work, you know. And a lot for a lot of collectors, there is that really personal connection that they make with the work, um, and that mm -hmm. will be sort of the motivating factor. But in terms mm -hmm. of length, um, you know. Don't, don't go crazy, but uh, feel free to elaborate. I think it's good to have more information than not enough. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, if, if you're very concise and you have maybe two or three sentences, that's totally fine as well. Yeah. Um, what about as far as like what people look for in terms of trends? Do you see a lot of people who are trying to buy specifically locally? or um, are targeting based on price or theme or all of the above? So we get a lot of different, um, we have a lot of different needs when it comes to collectors and interests. So we do have a lot of collectors that like to source locally or they might like to purchase a work from an artist um, from their, their favorite town that they've ever been on vacation on when they were in Europe. 20 years ago, you know, mm -hmm. so it's, it really varies. Um, a lot of people I think are initially sort of looking within a price point and that'll be their starting place. Um, and that's, that's generally, I think, uh, probably the biggest constraint. And then they'll probably consider size next, you know, mm -hmm. given the space, what they're working with. But um, I think people are a little bit more flexible with, with size, um, you know, if they find something that they really love and they make a connection with. And it might not be, you know, 48 by 48. It's like they'll find somewhere for it if they really love it. So, yeah. What yeah. about pricing? Do you have any, like, d does Saatchi help coach artists through pricing? And do you have, like, any mistakes or pitfalls you'd have artists avoid? Um, yeah. So, we provide a little bit of advice, but I also, we generally don't like to, you know, force anybody into a price range that they're uncomfortable with. Um, so artists, basically, you upload your work and you select the price that you want to sell that work for. Um, and what we recommend doing is just making sure that if you do have recent sales, you want to you want to keep your prices uh, relevant to those sales. So you don't want like a huge jump in price, um, and you want to make sure that you're, you know, charging for your work. You put in a lot of time and effort. You have to cover the cost of materials. Um, you want to make sure that you know you're you're covering any packaging costs. Like if you're going to have to create this artwork, make sure that you factor the price of the crate into the selling price. Um, what I also say to artists who maybe don't have so many um, past sales and like a really strong sales history to kind of gauge what they should be pricing an artwork at, um, I recommend that you know, and anybody can really do this. But if you go on Saatchi Art and you kind of look for similar work in a similar medium that maybe um, is the same size as your work and you look at who the artists are that are selling, I think if an artwork is selling, it's priced correctly. So mm -hmm. if something is really high, then you know it might not be so approachable to um, as many collectors. And you might just wanna kind of test it out and see where your sweet spot is. Um, and one thing that artists can do as well is just Upload works that are in a variety of sizes and price points, and then you're going to really see what people are responding to. Um, that's a really good strategy when you're getting started. Um, okay, we have a question from Brian. Yeah. Uh, is is Saatchi essentially acting as an agency where the artist vends their work through the site, or does Saatchi take any part in the reproduction of the work? Okay, yeah. Um, so we uh, artists can sell original work. They can also sell um, like limited edition prints um, or open edition prints that are artist produced. So the artist would take responsibility for the production of the work. And then we also offer um, open edition prints that are Saatchi art produced, uh, as well as a few limited edition prints that are Saatchi art produced. So basically that means that we work with um, a printer and um, a client can purchase the work, maybe something that's already sold and they really loved it, but they want it in a different size or so on and so forth. Um, and then we would fulfill those orders. So it's very hands off for the artist. You don't really have to do anything if you sign up to be part of our print process. But so it's voluntary also, I should say. You don't have to sell your sell prints of your work, but if you want to and you just want, you know, some, some money on the sales, then you can definitely do that. 
Do you have any way of distinguishing between um, print, like uh, hand pulled prints, like printmaking versus uh, like fine art prints? Right. Um, yes. So we mm. have a printmaking category on Saatchi Art where, um, you know, collectors can go and, sorry, there's a bug about to crawl on my camera. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, collectors can, you know, go and explore um, artists who work in printmaking and, you know, whether it's like silk screening or whatever the method is. Um, and then we also have a, a print section. The issue I think comes uh, when, you know, an artist might not be sure what their work qualifies as or if there's like any confusion. So because all of the listings are made by artists um, and sometimes it can be a little bit of a language barrier, um, you might get some crossover between the two, but we definitely have a section for printmaking specifically. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So this next question is about the market. And I, I do want to preface this with the artists that are listening that like, you know, you always want to make what you should be making or what you feel called to be making. Don't like rush to go do something just because it's selling a lot. Cause you're not, Gonna, it's not going to be as good as something you're really interested mm -hmm. in. That said, it's it's also like a, a commercial reality. If you if you are trying to make sales um, and you're curious to find ways to sort of like push you into that arena of income, um, what are some trends that you see as far as like medium or um, thematically uh i know we talked about like there's some specific sizes that you see requested yeah. a lot i think that's all <laughs> yeah. really interesting information sure yeah um so i think painting generally sells the best on sachi art um and then probably photography would be the next category um it's not to say that other categories don't sell as well categories being like sculpture or printmaking or um, new media or drawing, for example, collage. Um, so these uh, these mediums, they definitely do sell well, but I think we see a lot of uh, people who think art, they think painting, and then that's what they purchase. Um, and probably there are more collectors who are a little bit more uh, familiar with the art space and um, they are more willing and interested in branching into like different mediums. Um, but I would say probably that the number one uh, size of artwork that we sell and that we get requests for are works that are over 40 inches in length, um, up to 60 inches in length. So people write in to us every day, they take an art advisory quiz and we get these clients who are asking for help finding artwork for their living rooms or their offices. And you know, most of them want something big and landscape oriented for both their couches. And that is like the number one request that we get. Um, so if you're producing work that's like 40 to 60 inches in length and you're in kind of a approachable price point anywhere between, you know, 500 to $2,500, that's probably the number one block right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, and, but I, uh, I, I I also want to reiterate, like, don't make art that you don't feel something about because it's just smart, you know, art is about expressing who you are and um, you want to connect with your practice. And I think like if you're trying to knock something off or um, like produce something that's mostly motivated just by you, the fact that you've seen it sell elsewhere, it you know, it's not going to be as powerful as like your unique perspective and what you're creating. So I always hesitate to like give artists too much advice as to what they should be doing. I think just follow your instincts. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just good to know, like if you've been um, knocking out a bunch of like really long vertical pieces, for instance, sure. that, um, you know, you should always continue to experiment um, and, and push what you're interested in and push your practice. But um, if you're, if you do have an objective to like, you know what, I really just need to make an ex like add on an extra grand to my income each, each month or something like that, you yeah. know, 
um, that it's just good to know what those popular sizes are. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, let's see, no questions right now. Uh, framing, that's another one. Mm -hmm. Can you, we talked about that a little bit too. I think framing and shipping are two costs that both the buyer and the artist don't always calculate in. Um, mm -hmm. What are your suggestions as far as artists framing their own work? By framing, do you mean having something ship stretched or a decorative frame? Uh, okay, so like I am a paper artist and mm -hmm. um, if I have a work in an exhibition, um, it's usually required that I frame that piece, Got it. Got um, it. which gets expensive, um, but then upon selling it, I have to include that expense in the price. Mm -hmm. So let's say you do drawing or printmaking, or, you know, or it's a limited edition print. Um, what are your thoughts on like behind glass framing? Yeah. Um, so I would say that if, unless you have a really specific vision for how the work should be framed and in that way, the frame itself would be a sort of part of the experience of the artwork. Um, I would recommend not framing it. Uh, I think that a lot of the time collectors will have a really, you know, um, personal preference as to what the frame is going to look like in their home. Um, so they might end up reframing the work anyway. Uh, and I think also from what we've experienced, when a work is framed, um, there's like a little bit more chance that it could be damaged in transit just because you have those sharp corners. And when things get knocked around, the pressure will like you know, push, it could break the glass or it could crack the frame. Whereas if you have something that's just rolled in a tube and packed really well, it's going to be a lot more, um, you know, durable and it'll be able to withstand a lot more like, I know you put fragile on things, but people just, they do not respect the fragile stickers. So um, yeah, unless it's like really integral to the experience of the piece, I don't think that framing is necessary. Um, okay, we have a question from um, Helena. If I said your name right. Um, how and if coronavirus has affected Sachi Arts platform and art sales? Yeah, um, this is a great question, and um, it's really a surprising answer. So uh, obviously, just like every other business, we were very concerned with this whole pandemic, um, and when there was the, um, the the status of like it being a global pandemic when that was announced, we did see a sort of a dive. I think people were really like freaked out and panicking about the economy and so on and so forth. But um, after that, it has just been really nuts. We have so many people buying art right now and we have more new customers than we've ever had. Um, more visitors to our site every day, more orders being processed every single day. Um, and it's really because we have, you know, collectors all over the world who are stuck inside their houses, looking at their blank walls and working on those like home reno projects and thinking, you know, how can I upgrade my space? Here I am. Um, what am I going to do? I may as well do something with my time. Um, and then also they're looking for somewhere that they can go to you know, feel good. You don't want to read the news. Maybe you're tired of Instagram. Where can I go? I want to go look at beautiful art. So they're spending a lot of time on Sachi art, um, looking for work. And it's been, it's been really good for business, actually. And really great that like, we are able to help so many artists around the world um, continue to make money through this time, because it's been really difficult for a lot of people. So it's been it's been wonderful for our artists and for Sachi. Yeah. Um, Deepa is asking, how do you get a review on? Um, oh, Deepa, I guess you're saying you have an online platform and you'd like to get a review on it. Uh, how does one request yeah. a, a portfolio review? Um, so a portfolio review, you know, we're, the curators are always happy to look at an artist's portfolio and review the works. And if you have any questions, you know, we're always happy to help with that. So um, you can feel free to email us at 
curator at sachiart.com. Um, and one of us will get back to you. Okay. Uh, is there an age average for people who buy through Saatchi Art? I think like age average, but how would you describe your customer? I know you talked about yeah. kind of different customer categories. Yeah. Um, aside from those more corporate clients, how would you describe your sort of pedestrian customer? Um, so we have, I think the majority of our clients fall into three different categories. Uh, we have sort of like the empty nesters who are, you know, their home, they're redoing their home, they really kind of love, um, they're, they're motivated more by like an aesthetic than they are by um, the, the discovery process or investment. So um, they're a little bit older. And then we have a group of, I don't know, I wanna say they're maybe 30s plus, and um, they're looking, f they're, they're really interested in sort of connecting with the artists and discovering artworks and finding mm. art that really speaks to them. And um, they, what appeals to them is really the global nature of uh, the brand. So they might be you know, somewhere across the world looking at artists from the US or Canada, um, or they might be you know, in the States and they're you know, interested in checking out artists from South America or Africa um, or Asia. So uh, th those are two. And then the third would be um, the collectors who are a little bit more uh, investment oriented. So they wanna know who the up and coming artists are that are really selling and um, they're hoping to make a purchase that might you know, help diversify their portfolios. Have you seen a lot of that? What is the sort of upward mobility? Of, like if people reach a certain uh, caliber, do they stay with Saatchi art or do you see like, do you um, feel like you're more emerging or not? We, we definitely are more emerging and we have seen um, artists who have gained a lot of success and made a lot of sales through Saatchi Art and then maybe they were picked up by a gallery that was sort of more restrictive about where they showed their work. Um, they might leave Saatchi Art, which is always sad for us, but we're also always very happy to see people, you know, become really successful and be able to go off um, into different, you know, different spaces. Yeah. Do so... Sorry, I was go ahead. Gonna, no, I was just going to say, like, one who comes to mind would be um, Bradley Wood. Um, there are a few more. I can't remember their names, but, um, you know, just started with Saatchi, became really successful, and then um, they're no longer with us, but, yeah. Um, I was going to ask, do you think that galleries ever come to your website to look for oh, artists yeah. and then sort of like, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's and good. Other, that's good. It's it's a way it's to be good. found. Totally. Um, for, for the artist. <laughs> for, the, for the artist, it's great, right? The galleries will come. They'll look at who is doing really well or they'll, they'll use us. Um, we do publications where we are highlighting specific artists that we think are like up and coming and really cool or we just, whatever the, the, the topic is. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of gallerists will come and try to like take our artists. And yeah. <laughs> It's, it's great for the artists. It's a bummer for us yeah. when you guys disappear. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, this, I think it's also like one cool thing about your platform is that it's like this kind of no strings attached. Mm -hmm. um, although I, I wonder, do you know much about your licensing agreement? Like, obviously, you guys have the license to um, show the reproduction of the work on the site, but... Mm -hmm if you want to feature the artist in a publication like you were talking about yeah. um you reach out to the artist and get a different kind of licensing or is that all kind of all inclusive when they upload it's all inclusive um so i believe when you sign up for you know portfolio it kind of outlines everything but um basically any of the work on the site we are actively trying to feature it and promote it we don't ever publish it on anything that's not Saatchi art or part of um, something that we're working on. So like the other art fair, for example. Um, and so those images, uh, we just use them on like our marketing or newsletters. Um, there are cases where, you know, if 
uh, we have our press team is working with, like our PR team is, you know, working with a, another website and they're featuring Saatchi art and Saatchi art artists. Like in that case, those images, you know, of the artwork would be used, but everybody always gets credit for them. Do you find, uh, do you ever have problems with outside parties coming to your website and um, uploading or like screenshotting artist image and images and using them without consent? We have, um, our engineers have done something really great where you can actually download a high res image. So if you were to like take an image off the site, it would be really pixelated. Um, mm. So your images are always gonna be really protected. Cool, that's good. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Sorry, were you gonna say something else? No, no, no. Okay. No. Um, I'm going to back to the question box. Uh, Carmen asks, when a work sells, who handles the sales tax? Um, I think that depends where you live. Uh, if you're in the U.S. and you're an artist, it's technically your own business, so you want to keep track of what you make on those sales and then pay your taxes at the end of the year accordingly. Um, if you're like a U.K. or an EU-based artist, it's a little bit different. Um, I'm assuming none of you guys are, but maybe, I don't know. But um, we do have an artist handbook that sort of breaks down everything to do with financials so that you know exactly what you're responsible for and how you should be handling your account going forward. So um, I think I sent, I, I think I sent it to you, um, Adrian, the yeah. artist handbook where there are like so many resources um, from, again, taxes to packaging to how to take good photos. So there's a lot of information there. And um, if you ever do have any questions too, we have a support email that you can answer and they can help you get set up or answer any questions you might have about it. In particular for like the really technical stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna add those to the chat right yeah. now. And then um, I will also put that on an email. I follow up with you guys later so you can but this site is pretty easy to navigate if you sort of like, I think it's like if you scroll down, you find the artist yeah. resources. And you go down to the site directory at the bottom. And yeah, that's there. it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Kat, um, a, a CU member mm. who I know is on Saatchi. I love the collections aspect of Saatchi art. Is Saatchi working towards linking the collections the artists are a part of to their artist profiles? That's an interesting idea. I never thought about that. Um, I don't think we're working on that right now, just because if somebody was going to find your work in a collection and they really liked it, they could click through to your profile and see all of your artwork really easily. Um, but just because somebody likes one of your artworks doesn't necessarily mean that the collection that your artwork might be featured in would be relevant in the reverse direction, if you know what I mean. Um, but yes, uh, when an artist is featured in a collection, you get a little badge and it says artist featured in collection and it's just part of like um, adding a little bit of buyer confidence to an artist portfolio page. Um, but we're always basically merchandising work into collections. So we have uh, new collections on the homepage every day, every week, um, new collections going out in email all the time on social, um, we have, like a text chat, you can get like an SMS collection sent to you every once in a while, which is really nice and kind of like a fun way to, to browse art, it gets texted right to you. Um, but we do find that those collections are a really great source of um, client interest. So they'll, they'll go through the collection and it'll lead them down a rabbit hole to another artist and they'll find you know an amazing portfolio of work and then they'll buy your work from there. Cool. Um, okay, I guess, all right, we have like 15 more minutes. Um, you guys uh, hammer out some more questions if you have them. Um, I was gonna ask you to talk a little bit about the other art fair. I know that yeah. that's a Saatchi project um, that Sears Union has kind of uh, um, done a little stuff with you guys before. Um, why did you guys get involved in that project? Yeah, so the other art fair has been around, um, don't quote me on this, but I want to say since maybe 2012, and they were a London-based fair. 
Um, and Satyard acquired them, I'm not exactly sure when, a couple of years ago. But the, uh, the reason for doing so was because Saatchi Art and the other art fair both have um, this, this shared motivation of providing exposure um, for emerging artists and supporting their careers. So, um, you know, it was really like, it, it's a really, you know, sort of symbiotic relationship. We have um, artists who are Saatchi Art artists, they'll show at the fair, they'll have a lot of success in person, um, and that's through sales and meeting galleries and just having that exposure and connecting with other artists. And you get to be part of this in-person community. And it's a way for um, our collectors as well to have that in-person art experience that's lacking on Saatchi Art because it's online. Um, and then a lot of artists who are showing at the other art fair and maybe don't necessarily know anything about Saatchi Art will then learn about Saatchi Art and they'll upload and make profiles. Um, and we are able to promote artists' work throughout the year and really sort of keep the momentum of the fair going um, all year round as opposed to just that one weekend. So what we do is um, in you know, merchandising, we'll make collections or have dedicated newsletters to uh, highlight artists that have shown at the other art fair. Um, so we're really trying to promote those artists year round as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's a really good fair. Um, I think a lot of artists that you might speak to who have participated at the fair um, will say that it's, it's really great to like be a part of that community. Um, I know a lot of artists who have like be become really good friends with other artists that they meet at the fair and they end up, you know, collaborating and doing all sorts of neat stuff. So it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a good weekend. Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of interesting because um, you know, we have in Dallas, we have the Dallas Art Fair, which is like, you know, really, um, really great art, but it's galleries from all over the world coming in. So you're not necessarily going there for local. And then we have like art festivals, which is kind of the same thing. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. think that they're buying locally when they buy at art festivals and generally you're not. Um, so the other art fair is kind of like this opportunity to go see art made locally in your city. Um, not to say that Dallas doesn't have galleries that do a really good job of showing local work, but it's just another way to kind of like plug in. Um, okay, two questions ha from, mm -hmm. um, again, from Helena, uh, how you choose artists for exhibitions and such a gallery, video interviews or promotions? Yeah, like what do you go through, um, if, if you decide you want to do a, like a theme on figurative work, sure. What, how do you find those artists? Yeah, um, so it's, it's an involved process. Uh, what we do is we will review a ton of artwork, um, obviously really powerful work uh, that, you know, is like, whether it's like a really strong execution or something um, sort of like a new idea or a new take on something, um, if it really stands out, uh, these are artworks and artists that we would consider for a feature. Um, if a lot of buyers seem to be responding and we see that an artist is selling really well, that's a really good indicator that somebody's got something cool going on and we might, um, you know, look more into that artist for that reason. But some of the requirements that uh, need to be met in order to get a feature um, have to do with just availability of work and um, having like consistent pricing having good photos, having a lot of work available. So at least six pieces available on your profile, um, making, you know, being really professional and responsive to emails. So um, for example, if we reach out and say we have a collector interested in a work and we need more photos, or if um, a collector makes an offer on your piece and we wanna know if you accept that offer, if we don't hear back from you for like a week, that's really hard. Uh, so the sooner that you can get back to us to respond to an email, you know, it just goes a long way, just being professional and like really quick to get back, you know, it's business. Um, and having a portfolio with like a good photo of you in your studio working, um, and then all of like your, do you have a relevant education, exhibition, awards history, um, all of that. So just having a really fully fleshed out portfolio, good photos lots of art available and like 
being excited and responsive to emails and like willing to work with us, that really goes a long way. Thanks. Um, this is a good question. Um, Brian asks, in the spirit of trends and popularity, do you see a preference for buyers for more abstract work versus figurative or representational? Um, I want to say no. I know that a lot of people really love the idea of abstract work, and it's probably um, the number one most searched term. People are looking for really bright, happy, abstract artwork. Um, but whatever draws somebody into the site, uh, it might not be what they end up leaving with. So we, I think we sell just as many, um, just as many um, figurative or, you know, realist, surrealist uh, works versus abstract or abstract expressionist. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of our statistics too, like it might be that we have a lot of people that do buy abstract work, but um, a work I would probably qualify as figurative. An artist might say that it's abstract because it's a more abstract portrait, for example. I would still call it a portrait. So it's hard for us to know exactly, like our, our, our data is a little fuzzy just because everything is so subjective. Um, but I think we definitely sell a lot of uh, portraits and figurative works um, and then also just like more realist um, pieces. Um, but yes, abstracts we sell a lot as well. That's interesting because we have um, an artist we work with at the Cedars Union and he loves to um, paint people, but he is told often by gallerists that um, portraiture of a specific person is harder to sell. Do you find that to be the case? Like I see uh, behind you, you have like the back of a woman, like not her face. Correct. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think it depends. Um, that's, that's an interesting point. So yeah, I want to say that um, figurative or portraiture works featuring women probably sell more than men do. Um, and maybe like a, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I see a lot of our artwork sell that's like a, a portrait of somebody and it's a beautiful portrait. And I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's more difficult to sell. I just think that in our case, probably less artists are doing like really representational or realist portraiture. That would be like a, a portrait that somebody wouldn't necessarily want on their wall. But I don't know. I think there's, I think we have so many collectors um, on Such Yard that there's sort of something for everybody. And I think that, you know, if you're making work that like you really believe in, we can definitely find a buyer for your work. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Let's see. Let's hammer these out. Do you have any connection to Sachi advertising? Okay. Um, no. Uh, Saatchi Art was established by Rebecca Wilson, who was uh, the director at Saatchi Gallery in London, um, but we are no longer affiliated. Okay. Um, <laughs> what is? <laughs> I didn't even know there was a Saatchi advertising. Um, what is a good portfolio size, maximum amount of works, and minimum? Um, I also want to add to this question. Yeah. Um, do you like what tips do you have for editing your artwork? Do you think it's better to just like get all the stuff you're doing out there? Or do you want to really make sure you're not, you're like choosing your good work? Hmm. Um, okay. So minimum size, I would say six. If you're, if for Sachi art, it's, it's six. We like to see at least six pieces. Um, maximum amount, I think like, if your work is very, say it's, it's very similar, like a lot of your pieces have a really similar style or similar color palette, um, I would try not to put too many works up so that it would be overwhelming. You know, maybe start anywhere, if you're just starting a portfolio, anywhere between like six and maybe 25 pieces would be great. I think that's a good place to start. Um, I see a lot of artists that have hundreds of artworks on Sachi Art. Um, and some of them are really successful, and the reason they have so many is because they have sold so many pieces and they're always uploading new work. But I think it's important not to overwhelm um, a collector when they're coming to your portfolio. It's like, oh my God, there's so many great pieces. I don't know what to buy. I can't make a decision. 
it, it can it can be a little bit harder. It's like, you know, going to the grocery store and trying to pick a jam and like there are 40 jams. What jam is the right jam? I don't know. Like, I hate that. The jam um, study. But yes. Yeah, so hard. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then in terms of selection, uh, I think it's just good to have a variety of sizes and styles. And in terms of like editing, editing um, your personal work, I know that can be really difficult. Um, I, I think it's, yeah, I think it's good to maybe edit a little bit and just put up work that you like feel really good about. Um, and, you know, if you have questions and you're really struggling with it, like you can always email curator at satchyard.com. I'll put it in the chat. Um, you can always email us and we can like, you know, give you a hand. Yeah. Um, do you think if a work hasn't sold, like if you've had it up for like two years and it's not sold, do you think you should take it down? No. Okay. You never know who's going to find it and love it. Yeah. You know, it, it really is. It's, I, I see work that's a lot older that just didn't find the right buyer yet. And suddenly somebody finds it and purchases it. So I think it's, I think it's okay to keep it up. And okay. actually um, on, on that point, I want to say like, don't, if you are creating a such a portfolio, it's terrible um, when we experience broken links. So do not delete your artworks because if you delete your artworks, it will create a broken link and say somebody had your work in their favorites list and they've been coming back mm. and like checking you out. Um, and then you suddenly delete your artwork, it removes it from your favorites list and then the collector can't find you anymore. So if a work has been sold somewhere else or you don't want to, you know, it's not available for sale anymore, you can change the status and make it not for sale um, or mark it as sold, um, but don't delete it. That's okay, my, good to know. please don't delete yeah. it. <laughs> um, what kind of traffic do you have each day? Um, a lot. I don't have an, an exact number. I'm sorry. It's, it's quite a lot. It's, uh, it's more than any other online gallery by a lot, significant Do amount, maybe three times as much as the nearest competitor, but I don't know. Yeah, it does kind of feel like, um, I, you know, doing some research into this talk that y'all dominate. Um, what about sales? Do you have like a, um, average amount of sales that happen each day? Um, no, I think it, it fluctuates. Some days can be a little bit slower and some days it's like, oh my God, what's happening? We're never going to yeah. be able to process all of this. <laughs> so it really fluctuates. Um, and it's been really, it's been really good recently, which has been great. Um, have you ever had the experience of somebody selling artwork high price, but part of the money goes to charity? Um, yeah. Help or so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we actually had a lot of artists um, right in, well, okay, I'll start with this. Um, during the Australia fires, because we have uh, one of the other art fair shows is in Australia, um, and we have a really strong community of Australian artists on Touchy Art, um, we wanted to donate a portion of our sales to some of the organizations that were assisting with that. So we, um, we donated a portion of the commission that we receive. And then we all, when we let our artists know that we were doing this, um, a lot of artists wrote in and, and said, you know, like, I want to donate a portion of my proceeds. Um, it can be a little bit difficult to sort of coordinate that with so many artists. So what I always suggest is, like, if you have um, an organization that you really believe in and you would like to donate a portion of your proceeds to that, that organization, put it in your bio. Um, put like call that out let you know let collectors who are reading about you and your work know that that's what you're doing you can put it in the bottom of every description um, for your artwork uh, because it's, it's hard for us to manage like those payouts so if you want to do that that's fabulous um, and you can do that yourself and just let let people know about it okay that's a good tip um, what can artists do to promote his or her work um, that can be a big question. I, yeah. I'm going to guess that they mean kind of specifically on their side or if you have any um, suggestions um, otherwise. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not great at this personally. I um, like, I don't love social media a lot. So I've never really been a strong, I'm not like 
the person to be giving advice on this, but have a social media presence, post your artwork, post uh, links to where people can see more of your artwork and do it regularly. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think, um, Tatiana, I think you've been to, um, yeah, you've, you've been to some of our stuff before. I think the big things is website, um, internet presence through social media. But if you're trying to grant, like get, um, gain steam locally, also being seen and being active in your own art community is always helpful. I know that's a weird thing to suggest now because like no one's doing yeah. anything, <laughs> but, um, but having a presence online, I mean, that's why we're focusing so much on online stuff right now is just because it's like what we do have and how great is it that we do, um, Next month, we're going to have a webinar on building an artist website. If that's something that that you haven't done, you definitely should. Or if it's something that like, you know, like, I want a new one. Um, that's a good <laughs> thing to tune into also. Um, so that like, maybe someone finds you on Sachi Art, but then they buy one of the pieces and they want to be involved with you. And maybe they'll buy another piece in the future. So they're, they're going to want to like follow you on your social media or whatever. So. Keep yeah, we see, we see a lot of um, patronage of artists, like collectors will purchase a work and they'll come back and they'll purchase more work and they just find someone that they really connect with. So having that sort of a presence is really great. Cool. Um, I know I've asked you everything I have. Does, if anyone else listening has any more questions, go ahead and pop them in right now. Um, While you guys are thinking, I'm going to put my email address, which you'll probably, I mean, I'm sure Adrian, you'll maybe send something out after, but if anybody has any questions or you guys want to reach me, that's my email address. You can feel free to email me. That's great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Monty. This was, um, this was really good. I hope everybody yeah. found uh, the information helpful. Like I mentioned before, this will be available to watch later. Um, and if you know anybody who you think would uh, enjoy or benefit from this content, they can actually register after this is done. So um, we do allow uh, registration to happen afterward and you still get the link to watch. Um, so that's possible and that, that's possible with all our previous Cedars Union um, hosted webinars um, so yeah well thank you so much yeah, thank and you so everyone much. enjoy their evening thanks everybody bye